Well, happy Thursday to you and welcome back to our daily devotionals. This morning we're into Psalm number 19. It's one of my favorite Psalms. It's one of the earliest ones I was forced to memorize. Forced. I was asked, required, made to memorize for class in seminary about 20 years ago. But it's a great Psalm. There's lots of material here that you'll recognize, some of which hopefully again this morning will encourage you. It'll nourish your faith. It'll bolster your hopes as we continue to face whatever it is that you're facing. Psalm number 19, David writes, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber, and like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens, and its circuit to the end of them, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and keeping them there is great reward. Who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. And so here again, we have a psalm of David, a psalm of praise, a psalm laced with praise for God, but also intertwined through that praise is the reason, the cause. In this case, much of it is about the revelation of God. It's revelation of God both in creation, what we sometimes refer to theologically as general revelation, but also the revelation of God via scripture, what is usually referred to by theologians as special revelation. In other words, what David is saying throughout this psalm is ultimately that no matter where you look, we see God's greatness. Whether we look to the heavens or whether we look to the pages of a book, it all declares the greatness and glory of God. And so let's think about this psalm for just a few moments. Verse 1, the heavens, he says, declare the glory of God. And then written as poetry, it has a parallel, a part two, thought A, thought B. And the sky parallels the heaven. Above proclaims, parallels, declares his handiwork. And so the heavens declare the glory of God. The sky above proclaims his handiwork. When we look at the creation, what's above us, we see God's hand. We see cause for his praise. Day to day, our daily existence, what we might call providence, pours out speech and night to night reveals knowledge. Everything about your life, look around you, pay attention, ask why, what am I supposed to learn and see what it is that the daily events of your life reveal to you about God. There's no speech. There are no words whose voice is not heard. Their voice, creation, the things around us, verse four, goes out through all the earth and their words to the end of the earth. No matter where you are, no matter who you are, you're without excuse, Paul says in Romans chapter 1, because all of creation declares the glory of God. It goes on and gives us examples. He says, for example, it's like this. He set a tent for the sun, which has come out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber, and like a strong man and runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens, its circuit to the other end of them. Nothing's hidden from its heat. The sun rises, the sun sets, Everyone sees that. Everyone knows that. Wherever you are in the world, you experience that same thing that we experience here in South Carolina. That reveals the glory of God. The fact that it does it every day, like clockwork, that it goes and goes and goes. This is what some apologists, people who defend the Christian faith, might refer to as the intelligent design theory, that we look at the world and we realize that it's perfectly made, that it functions exactly like a designer had created it, that it didn't come about by accident, that it is what it is because someone made it to be that way. 
you know, the fact that the earth is the perfect distance from the sun. We're neither going to freeze to death nor burn up as though we were closer to the sun, that the tilt of the earth, all those things all point to the fact that there is this magnificent creator who's made this universe, not merely for our comfort and our pleasure, but that we might know about him, that we might know him. And so the, the creation then starting in verse 7, in the middle portion of the psalm, he turns to special revelation, to scripture. And notice what he says about it. The law of the Lord is perfect. And what does it do? It revives the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure. What does it do? It makes wise the simple. It reveals God to us. The precepts of the Lord are right. What do they do? They rejoice our hearts. The commandments of the Lord is pure. What does it do? It enlightens our eyes. What's he want to accomplish? What's David trying to communicate about God's word? What does it do? How do we respond? He continues in verse 9. The fear of the Lord is clean. It's right to fear, to reverence, to you know respect God as God and recognize that you're not. The fear of the Lord is clean. It's what it's supposed to be. What does it do for us? It endures forever. It's salvific. The rules of the Lord are true. The righteous all together. And so rather than running away from God's commandments, rather than complaining about God being a killjoy and trying to limit our fun as some people think the Ten Commandments, for example, do to us, David says, no, they're not there to ruin your life. They're to free your life to free you from sin, to obey God's word, to read it, to know it, to hide it in your heart, as the psalmist will say in Psalm 119, is to set us free from sin. Notice what he says then ought to be our response to such things in verse 10. More to be desired are they than gold. Yea, as the old King James would say, even much fine gold. Many things we can have, stuff, possessions, cars, wealth, money, health, God's self-revelation, God's rules, God's commands, God's precepts, those things that prepare us for eternity in his presence, those are the things that we ought to long for most. They're sweeter than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. They're to be desired and enjoyed. Moreover, he says in verse 11, by them your servant is warned, Shown what the path will lead if we go that direction. And in keeping them, there is great reward. So who can discern his errors? As we read scripture, we see some errors. Others we still fail to understand. We don't grasp just yet what this sin might be. Maybe one day when you're reading the Bible, an idea will come to your mind and go, that's what that meant. But notice what David's prayer is right at the moment in verse 12. For fear that there's something he does not yet understand that offends God. Declare me innocent from hidden faults, right? We often talk about sins of omission and commission. Commission are those sins we do, we break God's law, even when we know it's forbidden. Sins of omission is the sins that we commit. They're still sins, but we're guilty of them out of our own ignorance. So David says, declare me innocent from hidden faults. Lord, show me my sinfulness and forgive me of it, even if I don't recognize it. Then also, sins of commission are mentioned there in verse 13. Keep your servant back also from presumptuous sins. The sins we know are wrong. The things we know we ought not do that we still do. Let them not have dominion over me. And so when God will show us our hidden faults and forgive us, when he'll free us from our presumptuous sins, then he says in verse 13, the middle, I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. We need God's forgiveness. We need God to convict us of our sins and convince us of his righteousness, show us what we've done wrong, and accept our pleas for forgiveness. And then he ends with these words in verse 14. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. It's not accept them, God. It's let them. In other words, he's placing it on the altar before God and saying, God, only you can make these things acceptable Lord, may you do so in my life. And who is this God to whom he cries, to whom we look, the one upon whom we depend? O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. 
Back to that common refrain from David that God is his rock, his high tower, his hope, his place of peace and security. Why? Because he's our redeemer. May you look to God. May you look for God. And may you depend on God for all things. And may he make you pure. May he make you righteous. And he can do so only in Christ. And pray that that's the understanding you have today and the relationship you enjoy with him. May God bless you and keep you until next time.